right, so we are in part five now, part five of finding purpose, right? Something that we all want to do in our lives. We all want to find purpose. Now, last week, we talked about finding purpose in weightlifting. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Ah, <laughs> uh, Brooks's dad just walked in. I had to throw that out there. So, <laughs> no, finding purpose, finding purpose in work, right? Finding purpose in work. We all want to have a purpose in life. We all want to um, know what we're supposed to be doing. And when it comes to work, that's uh, you know one of those things that uh, we seem to just continually do, and we almost find that there's that there's no end in sight, right? Especially when you're a young person, uh, there's just no end in sight. You, you, you want to work towards the goal of retirement. And uh, I tell everybody that I'm retired, and that is I was tired yesterday, and I'm tired again today. And But uh, honestly, I have a long way to go before I'm retired, actually. And so finding purpose in work can be a, can be a tough thing. I mentioned last week that uh, you work so that you can help yourself, number one, number two, was work so that you can help others, and uh, thirdly, work so that you can please God. So those were the three main points last week, but we're going to talk about finding purpose in leadership, specifically in, uh, in governmental leadership, okay? Now, by way of introduction, leadership can be difficult to explain. It can be difficult to explain because it has this idea that somebody is in charge, and having somebody in charge usually is sometimes can be kind of tough to deal with, you know? Because that means if somebody is leading, somebody is following. So it can be tough to explain, and it can be tough to swallow this pill. There is, however, a purpose in leadership. There's a purpose in leadership. Now, whether sacred or secular, and I want to say this, that God really ordained three different institutions. And that was all he ordained. He ordained the government, the family, and the church. And that was it. Those were the three institutions he ordained. So those are the three institutions I want to cover. This morning, we're going to talk about this first one, the government. Now, there's a couple of cautions as we talk about the government, okay? Okay. A couple of three cautions, particularly. First of all, let me say this, that not all leaders are good leaders. Now, that goes without saying, right? Now, there is not a perfect leader out there. Now, we might think that we have our own persuasion on who would be a good leader, but even that good leader has, its, has their downfalls. Now, even the worst of leaders probably have some, some good qualities, even though they might be bad in what they believe, they're probably somewhat a leader, right? But not all leadership is good leadership. So what do we do with leaders who aren't good? Well, let me give you a verse for this. It's wonderful. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Listen to this. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. So what do we do when we have leaders that are not all that good? Well, it says right here, servants be subject to them. It's always easy to submit yourselves to people who are easy masters. But here this verse says that we need to submit ourselves not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. And it goes on and it says, why? For this is thankworthy. Here we go. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now that's... That's big, right? Because here you are, you're going to suffer grief. You're going to endure grief. You're going to, you're going to go through a trial in your life because there's a, a leader over you, and you're going to endure grief, and you're going to suffer wrongfully. Maybe that is that you've already done right. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? So if you've done wrong and you're being chastened for it, what glory is it to God if you endure that? If you're just all like, hey, I deserve this. It's like the guy that goes out speeding and gets a speeding ticket and is all upset about it. Or what about the guy who goes out speeding, gets a speeding ticket, and takes it patiently? 
Here, here, listen to this. But if when ye do well and suffer for it. Now that's the guy who's out there doing the speed limit. He's the guy out there going the speed limit and he gets a speeding ticket. Ye take it patiently. Now this is acceptable to God. Now that's heavy. And here's why that's heavy. Because we all know that it's okay to be rebuked when we've done wrong. But what about when we've done right? See, not all leaders are good leaders. There's a lot of leaders, a lot of leadership out there that isn't good. Now, that's number one. Number two, number two. And this is just by way of introduction. Complaint against this leadership is really a complaint against God. Complaint against leadership is a complaint against God. Now, that's, that's big. Because you know what? I think there's times that we all want to complain about leadership. Isn't that right? We all want to complain about the president. We all want to complain about his cabinet. We all want to complain about every leader that's over us. We all want to say, but fooey to them because they're not good leaders anyway. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the complaint against this leadership is a complaint against God. Listen to this verse in Exodus chapter 16, verses 7 and 8. And in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. Now, they were being provided, Israel was being provided food, and they didn't like the food that they were being provided. They didn't like the provision. So here's what he says. For that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord, and what are we? that ye murmur against us. And Moses said this. This is what he said. Ready? This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us. Moses knew that, hey, listen, even though I'm the leader and you're, and, and you're complaining against me, your grievance isn't with me. It's with God. When it comes to leadership, they're not all good. But your complaint that we complain against the leaders is really against God. And now a lot of people will say, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, it's, it's, well, they'll come up with all sorts of things. They'll say, first of all, it's not really a complaint. <laughs> and you know it's a complaint. <laughs> come on, you know it's a complaint. We all complain about it, right? It doesn't make it right. Just because all of us do it doesn't mean it's right. Just because one person gossips doesn't mean that it's, it's okay. Or because if everybody gossips doesn't mean it's okay for another person to gossip, right? If one person is complaining, it's wrong. And if a hundred people are complaining, it's wrong. The grievance was not against the leadership. The real grievance is against God. And here's why. The third thing, the third caution. All leaders are in the place of authority. Now listen to this. All leaders are in the place of authority because God put them there. Or he allowed them to be there. All leaders are in authority because of God. And there are just no two ways to slice this. The people that are in power are there because God has allowed them or put them there. Yeah, and now that's not something we all like to admit. We all like to think that, well, we as a republic, we go out and we vote. Yeah, I get that. But you know what? Here's the real deal is that God has allowed them to be there. So your complaint against the leader is really a complaint against God who put them in that position of leadership. Let me give you an illustration. President Barack Obama was my president and President Donald Trump is my president. And they will both receive the same level of respect. There are things that one person did that I didn't like, and there are things that another person does that I don't like. But they are both my president. And so would any president that is elected or that is there, because the leadership that is there is there because God has put them or allowed them to be there. So let's stop complaining against God because he allowed the leaders to be there in charge. Now listen, let me, let me, tell, let me tell you a little bit more about this. The leadership in government. And uh, Romans chapter 13 is probably one of the most exhaustive passages on this topic of leadership, governmental, civil leadership. 
okay? There's a lot of passages on leadership that will blend throughout this week and the following, but this is probably the most exhaustive piece right here. Ready for this? Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. There's a lot of commentary here that I can give you, and I'll try to, try to spare some talking, but uh, who knows. Let every soul, that's you, and that's me, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now, again, contextually, this is talking about civil government. This is talking about government. You read, you read all, of, all of Romans. This is exactly what Paul is trying to get across in Romans 13. This is it, civil government. Here it is. Let every soul, you and I, be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. There's no power but of God. Who gives out the power? It's God. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. These powers that be, the powers that are there, are, are, are placed there, are put there, because God has either allowed them to be there or he has put them there himself. Any way you look at it, they're ordained of God. goes on to say this. Ready? Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, whoever resists those powers that be in power, in leadership, here it is, resisteth the ordinance of God. Ah, ready? It gets better. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, that's heavy. That's big. You resist the powers that, or, that, powers that be, that are ordained of God. You are resisting God. And you shall receive to yourself damnation. Those that are in authority are there because of God. Those who rebel against that authority by virtue of that rebellion are rebelling against God. Now, let's talk about something. Because in all leadership, we all have our what-ifs, right? So we're going we're gonna to cover some what-ifs <laughs> just real quickly. Because we always say this. We always say, everything, everything is like hypothetical, right? But what if, you know, Adolf Hitler came back? Okay, we'll deal with that. Because that's like a bad scenario, right? What if... What if, um, well, let's, let's see this. What if the government is, uh, what, if, what if those people in government are sinners? Okay, oh, good, they are. So if we reject leadership because leadership sins, then we might as well just never have any leadership at all because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You understand what I'm saying? So no matter what the leader doesn't matter how bad they are, because guess what? Whosoever keepeth the whole law, and yet offend at one point is guilty of, law, of all. So the person who, who uh, he, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. So we say, well, what if Adolf Hitler's in, uh, in, in, in power? And uh, there he is. And, uh, and so what about him? He's a murderer. But what about the person who hates? Is he not a murderer too? So who do we, who, so are, are we supposed to resist all this power? Now listen. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, but what if, what if the government's not nice? What if the government's not nice? Well, is there any good? Is there, is, is, is there anybody that is good? There's not one person who's nice, right? Let's just face it. Y'all are not nice, <laughs> right? I mean, you can't honestly tell me that you are a good person because... Uh, it says in the Bible that you deceive yourselves if you think that there's any good in you. So you can't say that. So now what we end up doing, we end up with these levels of morality. And who do we submit to based on the levels of morality that they have? The, 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 the levels of, of, of ethic. So none of us are nice. And quite frankly, the Bible covers that, right? Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. So what if your government's a jerk? Oh, be subject to them. That's interesting. Okay, let's say, uh, let's say worst case scenario, right? Worst case scenario, what they tell us, the government tells us, here it is, what they tell us is in direct conflict to what God has told us. 
Worst case scenario, here it is, the worst case scenario is the government tells us to do something that we shouldn't do because it's in conflict with what God has said for us to do. Right? That's what it was in the, uh, in, in the book of Acts, chapter 5. Remember, they were out there, they were preaching the gospel. Peter and the apostles, they were out there preaching the gospel. They were imprisoned. You remember, they, they were imprisoned because they were told not to preach the gospel, but they preached the gospel. Because what God told them was to preach the gospel. So they're out there, they're out there preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. They get in prison, they get thrown into jail, they get let out of jail, and they go to preach the gospel. Well, what do you do with that? Worst case scenario, he covers that right here in Acts 5.29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Worst case scenario is that God always comes first, no matter what. No matter what. And we can have all sorts of what ifs. We can have all sorts of what ifs, and, and, and we can create in, in our mind like this kind of what if paradigm. Like the whole tax thing bothers me. Okay, it bothers me. Well, we shouldn't pay taxes to a government who gives their money to Planned Parenthood. You know what? I don't like paying taxes, but I pay my taxes because you know what? Jesus paid taxes. And he paid taxes to Rome. Do you think Rome had like some really, do you think they were upstanding citizens, the Roman? I, they weren't. But Jesus paid taxes to Rome. And here's what you hear. Here's what you hear. This is the rhetoric. But if we pay taxes to somebody who promotes a, 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 a pro-abortion agenda, well, let me say something okay, about that. I just want to say it very clearly. Pay your taxes. Because if you don't get it through the income taxes, they're going to get it through sales tax. So what, are you never going to buy anything? Of course we're going to buy things, right? You don't think that the Waltons, you go to Walmart and you buy something, you don't think the Waltons are donating their money to an agenda that we disagree with? Of course they're doing that. So what, we're never going to go to Walmart, we're never going to go to Amazon, we're never going to go to Target? I, I did. I don't shop at Target. But that's for a couple of reasons. Anyway... Now listen, we can't boycott the world, okay? Because no matter what we do, no matter what we do, they're going to take the money and they're going to spend it inappropriate. Let me give you a great example of this. And I had mentioned this a long time ago, so if you've heard this, bear with me. I had a friend of mine doing construction who uh, I, I, was, I was building out a basement for the vice president of a, of a company called Morgan Stanley. Okay, I was building his basement for him. It's a really legit basement, really cool. And I needed someone to build... Um, to, to build a uh, kind of a wet bar area. And he was a, uh, this guy, I asked him, I said, hey, listen, I said, will you come and will you build this, this kind of wet bar? And, and he's, he put his foot down, and he says, you know they're going to use this for drinking alcohol. And I said, they're gonna, they can use it for a lot of things. That's the bottom line. They're gonna, they're gonna, somebody, he's going to pay somebody good money. And not only is he going to pay somebody good money, but that person that he pays probably isn't going to be tithing it either. Okay, so I mean, sooner or later, this guy's going to have a wet bar in his basement. He's probably going to eat Cheerios over, too. He's, probably, he's not that bad of a guy. Now, I, I get it. I'm sure they had drinks over this bar. But you know what? They're going to do that in a kitchen, too. They're going to do that anywhere, anytime, because that's just what they're going to do. So what, we're never going to build any kitchen with any countertop? And I had this discussion with this guy. Not so animated. Not so animated, but I did. I had this discussion. I'm like, come on. You're never going to drive down the road and fill up at BP because BP, you know, they're using their money not for godly purposes. So how far do you go with this whole tax thing? Pay your taxes because that is just what's going to happen. We're supposed to obey our masters according to the flesh. Here's what Ephesians chapter 6 says. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Our masters, according to the flesh, one category of that mastership is government. Obey them. Now, if and when they directly tell you to do opposite of what God wants you to do, then you obey God. Then you always, always, always obey God. As a matter of fact, we obey them as you would Christ. Look at the end of that verse. 
with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. We obey them with such totality that we are obeying them as if they would be Christ. Obey them. Now again, Acts 5.29 is still relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. If they say to you, you must kill this person, then you obey God. So the worst case scenario has been dealt with. Okay, so what is the purpose of governmental leadership? What is the purpose of governmental leadership? We get that out of the following passage, again, in Romans. Uh, We've covered 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2. Now let's cover 3 and 4. For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, now shall have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Now let me just backtrack just a second. Is any leadership perfect? No. Is any leadership going to be totally good? No, there's none good, no, not one. As the Bible says. So if you say, well, we're only going to follow good leadership, you've just excluded everybody. Okay? Let me keep reading. Uh, But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So here is the purpose. Ready for this? Here's the purpose. Simply put, rulers are to reward the good and to punish the evil. Reward good, punish the evil. Now, does that happen? Of course not. Not all the time. Not all the time. Does it happen sometimes? Sometimes. A lot of times they reward the evil and they punish the good because leadership is not perfect. Because leadership and everybody in that role is a sinner. No one in that role is perfect. No government, no governmental agency, no person in government is perfect. Now listen, the purpose of government has been, has been diluted and it's been polluted. It's not what it should be. It's not what it should be. There is nobody in leadership that does what they should, and there's nobody in this room that does what they should either. But God has given us a mechanism. He's given us a mechanism, a way by which we can put the right people, godly people, in leadership. And it's not through rebelling against the authority. It's using the system that we have. You know, some of the, some of the people who complain the most about the government are people who don't even vote. And you know what? Let me tell you this, friends. If you complain, first of all, you shouldn't be complaining because that complaining is against God. But you need to be voting. You need to know the issues, biblical issues, biblical issues. By the way, let me just say this, biblical issues. Always vote on biblical issues. Many of you know I carry a gun most of the time. If the government came and took my gun, I would give it to them. I might give it to them barrel first. I might say, I think, I might even say, I think it's loaded. <laughs> but the bottom line, the bottom line is having guns is not a biblical issue. There are other biblical issues we need to stand for. I like my, I like my firearms. But nowhere in the Bible does it say, thou shalt have an H and K or a SIG, or a Smith & Wesson. <laughs> I wish it did. Matter of fact, I think it's in the Hebrew. If you turn over to <laughs> First Opinions, no, I'm kidding. Now listen, here's the deal, here's the deal. We have a mechanism in place by which we can, we can elect proper people. And we all ought to be involved in that process. We all ought to be educated on the issues, and we all ought to defend the faith that way too, because listen, that is the way that is what God has given us to determine the outcome of our, of our government. Now, is it perfect? No. Is the system broken? Yeah, I'm sure it is because nothing's perfect. But our responsibility before God, our civic duty, is to vote. That's what we have. It's all we have. And so we need to make sure that we are doing that. Now, these, this is a choice that we make to vote. And it really is up to you. But the Bible 
kind of makes it pretty clear that this is what we need to do. And when I think about our responsibility before God, first and foremost, our responsibility before God, is no different when we look at Acts chapter 5, when we look at what Peter and the apostles did, when we look at the commandment to preach the gospel to every creature, we have a responsibility before God to propagate the message of grace that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin. We have a responsibility before God to share the gospel with people. That is our first and, first and, 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 and foremost, it's our primary responsibility, is to make sure that people know where they're going when they die. And so let me ask you this question. Are you absolutely certain that if you were to die today that you would go to heaven to be with you? I ask a lot of people that and I get a lot of I get a lot of crazy answers. I get a lot of people who say, well, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I tell people, listen, being good is good, but being good isn't good, good enough to go to heaven. You've got to be perfect to go to heaven because only perfect people are in heaven. And how do you do that? You're like, Pastor Joe, we, you just said that there's, that there's none good, no, not one. That's right. Most people trust in their own goodness in order to achieve salvation, and that's wrong. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says God loves us and hates our sin. A lot of people say you have to turn over a new leaf. Some people say you have to get water baptized or walk an aisle or pray a prayer or raise a hand or give money to the church. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the wages of sin, listen carefully, is death. The wages of sin is not church membership. The wages of sin is not walking in aisle. The wages of sin is not praying a prayer. The wages of sin is not giving money to the church. The wages of sin is that someone had to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth and he died on the cross for your sin. I want this hand right here, and I mean it reverently to represent the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that he who knew no sin was made sin for us. See, he, he didn't have a sin pa- penalty, a sin payment to make for himself because he knew no sin. So he who knew no sin was made sin for us. See, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sin. And if he made the payment, then we don't have to. See how simple salvation is? It's when you in the quietness of your mind believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. It's when you accept that free gift of salvation. It's not about working a work. The Bible says it's to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. His faith, not his works, his faith. It's when you in the quietest of your mind believe, Lord, I trust you, I believe in you, I'm depending on you for my salvation. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. He was buried and he rose again the third day to show that his payment was sufficient. That's how awesome salvation is. It's awesome that we can't earn it. You know what? We can't lose what we didn't earn. The Bible says that we're kept saved by the power of God and the salvation. By God's power, he holds us. We don't hold ourselves. This isn't something we can lose. It's not something we can give back. We trust Christ and he secures us. He seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1. He seals us. He gives us the earnest of the inheritance. That's a down payment. He's coming back to get the Holy Spirit. That's the way it works. It's amazing. I can't do anything to lose it. It's wonderful. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I beg of you to place your faith in him alone as your Savior.